Well, I'm Dick Wilkins from Phoenix Technologies, one of the IBVs. I prefer to call it IFVs now, you know, firmware vendors, not BIOS. We don't do BIOS anymore. <laughs> so anyway, uh, my talk here is basically just kind of a heads up, things to watch, things upcoming that may be of interest. Uh, I suspect there's going to be a good deal of overlap in the presentations over the next few days, and that's OK. We want to stress things that are important. So, so what we're going to talk about, IoT, UDK 2018, NIST guidelines, and some TCG t stuff that, of interest to folks. So security-related topics that we feel should be on all of your radar. You need to be paying attention to this stuff. Some of it matters to different companies, but it's stuff pretty much everybody should care about in some way. So the intention of this is to raise awareness generally. UEFI and the Internet of Things. The forum and the board of directors has stated, has a stated intention of broadening the reach of UEFI to all kinds of devices, mobile, uh, the mobile devices, phones, you know, those kinds of things, in addition to the traditional PCs. And one of the areas that uh, we feel like there might be significant added value is in the Internet of Things. So um, at the request of the UEFI Forum and the Industry Communications Working Group, I've done a couple things in just the last few weeks. I wrote an article for Embedded Computing Design, just a, a light introductory material for a magazine for people in the IoT space, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. There's a link to it. Um, also, there's, um, as somebody said earlier, gee, we're starting to get famous out there. People beyond just the, the core group of geeks <laughs> that pay attention to this space are uh, suddenly aware of what UEFI is and not just as, gee, this thing that won't let my system boot because of secure boot, but more to it than that. And so we were requested to appear on a podcast for Security Weekly. Um, uh, Stefano and I um, both did a presentation about 45 minutes each uh, over the last couple couple weeks, really, for that podcast. Uh, mine is listed there. It's on YouTube, so you can go look. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to summarize the article that I wrote for you folks. Um, the Internet, Internet of Things have been t touted as, in articles out there, the, the next big thing, or the Internet of crappy things. And <laughs> both of those, I think, are justifiable in some way or another. Uh, IoT devices, we all have heard the press about them being involved in distributed denial of service attacks. Um, they, people, children's fuzzy bear with a, uh, a connection to the internet have exposed the personal information about children and their activities, those kinds of things, and it just keeps going. There have been reports of IoT devices attacking inside of co corporate and personal firewalls, that kind of thing, once they're in there and they go rogue, they can do anything inside your firewall. So the traditional software type security, um, authentication and stuff is going to get fixed. I mean, these people are not idiots. They're, they're, they're going to go out there and fix it. So just like computers did, um, the, you know, the, the basic software is likely to get fixed. But so what are the bad guys going to do? They're going to attack the firmware. They have the, these devices have the same attack surfaces as a computer system that's plugged into the internet. They're, they're just computer systems that are plugged in the internet. They're not ching, cheap, single-use, throwaway devices like some people consider it like the stuff embedded in my sneakers or something. They're, they're, they can be pervasive devices, and as somebody commented during an earlier presentation, they have lifetimes. I mean, I've been hooking up Internet of Things devices in my personal home setup, you know, controlling lights and the, uh, the Alexas of the world and those kinds of things. And those are expected to stay around for a few years. And they could stay in my environment for a long time. Um, they can be used to steal data, spy inside the firewall, launch attacks on other systems inside the firewall or outside, wherever. So you can't just consider them cheap, throwaway devices that nobody's going to care about. So what I suggested in the article is folks need to consider using UEFI firmware for these devices. Um, 
at, I'm preaching to the choir here, but security is part of our specification. It's rooted right in the system. Uh, we have a proven security design. As Mark said earlier, um, the design seems to hold up. We've had a lot of people putting pressure on it all over the place looking for flaws <laughs> and they haven't found any. Yeah, they found a few implementations that are a little shaky here and there, but uh, those have been fixed. And, um, we need to work to make our implementations better, but uh, the, so far the architecture looks solid. Uh, Secure Boot uh, prevents, as you know, uh, bad software from running, corrupted software from running, and capsule updates prevents them from being updated with the wrong stuff. Uh, one of the comments I make in the article is, these devices have to be updated in the field. They're complex, they, they will have flaws, they're gonna have to have be updated just like the firmware on your PC needs to be updated, as Mark said. Um, these have gotta be updated, and we can't expect home users or Internet of Things users to be manually updating the firmware on their, uh, Phillips light controller or something like that that controls the lights in their house or uh, something like that. Th these have all got to be automatic push type um, updates. So they had better be secure because if they're con connected to the internet and they're not secure, then the bad guys can update them with their own software and God knows what, what they'll be doing. So why isn't everybody using UEFI firmware now in this space? Uh, inertia. These, a lot of these developers come from the uh, embedded and system on a chip space where U-Boot and Core Boot have been around forever and people keep using them and they seem to be fine. And, and let me just say that there are security add-ons for those pieces of software that are acceptable, who use work pretty well, but they're add-ons that can be, you can choose the wrong one, you can uh, leave them out, whatever, and now you've got a problem where as you know, secure boot and things like that are part of UEFI embedded right in the, the architecture. Another thing is this old bugaboo that we've had about UEFI and the evil, the empire trying to take over the world and prevent your system from booting OSs or uh, software that's not, uh, you know, not approved by some big company from Redmond or <laughs> like that. Uh, these misconceptions and alternative facts um, have been poo-pooed uh, pretty clearly in white papers presented by the forum, and I point to those in the article. Bottom line, IoT developers need to consider, there's a, and a, uh, there was a posting in response to my article that referred to this as a rant. I, didn't, I don't think this really qualifies as a rant. Um, I just suggested that they take a look at it. <laughs> I didn't say, you must do this. <laughs> anyway, um, it supports the Intel architecture and ARM now and potentially other articles in the future. We heard rumors and it was discussed at a plug fest that there might actually be a version of Core Boot that has uh, UEFI interfaces on top of it. So that may exist out there in the world. I haven't seen it, but um, so, and nothing prevents that. Um, independent firmware vendors, not IBVs, uh, can help. There are, there are several of us out there and we would love to take on a project to help people um, develop so firmware for their IoT device. And for you folks in the room, uh, you need to be aware of this space and be thinking about how does my software, my device, my firmware, whatever, fit into the IoT space? Um, how might I be engaged with this space? And what would happen if somebody approached me with questions about how my software or whatever might work in this space? So you need to be thinking about this. So that's IoT from my perspective. UDK 2018. Uh, there's a posting on the Tiano Core page that talks about 2018 coming up. There are many more experts than me out there, but I just wanted to kind of flag and wave the big flag up there saying, it's coming soon, um, according to the, to the posting on the Tiano Core page, it's Q1, which is like got a few days left in it. <laughs> I suspect they might not make the Q1 deadline, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Brian's doing a quite a, crossed fingers here. Well, we'll see. But 
there are going to be new features in the code base. We should all be paying attention and make sure that they're in our code. I know a lot of folks wait until they have a stable UDK version to pull stuff over to their code base other than emergency stuff. So this is the opportunity you need to be paying attention to this. I pulled just a couple things out of the, um, the announcement of what's going to be in UDK 2018. Um, Here's an AC, uh, ACPI table that's being deprecated that relates to SMM. Anything that touches SMM, as we just saw in the previous presentation, is important, and people be, need to be paying attention to that. So there, anything SMM related has security implications. Um, IOMMU and DMA protections also pre presented in the last presentation. Uh, this is the idea that uh, DMA devices that can potentially be plugged in via um, a, P a PCI connector or a Thunderbolt bus kind of thing with an external PCI, whatever. These devices can be programmed to be bad actors and do nasty things to your system. Uh, we pushed through, the PI working group pushed through a change that allows you to disable um, DMA bus mastering on segments of the PCI bus where it's not needed to boot during the boot process. So it was a tiny baby step, but a step in the right direction. The, the spec specifically said you must turn on bus mastering on all PCI bridges, which was like, why? <laughs> so just as a first step, you know, the firmware shouldn't be enabling um, any PCI bridge that doesn't need it. Uh, but obviously a more complete solution is early setup of the IMMU and the equivalents on different platforms to make sure that, uh, that you're doing the right thing and, the, and DMA devices can't go rogue and get control of the system. So there will be an implementation of this in uh, UDK 2018, the open source, so use it. In 2012, Phoenix Technologies, I made a presentation on uh, protections of things like stack guard, heap guard, null pointer detection, using uh, memory protections, those kinds of things. To, uh, we're really thrilled that finally, after uh, six years, it's now made it into the open source available code base. These capabilities are there now and available for everybody to use without having to code it or use prototypes or whatever it is, a tested version of it will be in UDK 2018. And Phoenix, um, who championed these early on, are, are thrilled that everybody will have them available now. And my last area, um, I think this is actually some of the most interesting. NIST guidelines, also mentioned in the last presentation. Who here knows, who here doesn't know what 800-155 is? 193 and 147 were mentioned in the earlier one. Who doesn't know what 800-155 is? I, I, yeah, I see a sprinkling of hands, but actually a bunch of hands. Okay, came out in 2011, a long time ago. And this was the idea, and I'll very briefly summarize, the idea that use the measured boot capability, not secure boot, but measured boot, that you measure as the system boots all the software and the configuration data and the configuration of hardware and pull that all into a set of golden measurements. And you supply that when the IT department configures a machine, they run everything, get it configured the way they want it, and then boot it up and save the golden measurements of what the, the system looks like safely booted. Not the stuff that's dynamic and changes all the time, but the things that are statically pretty much stable and don't change. Then they supply that to an attestation server that sits out in the network someplace. Then in future boots, when a system boots up, it remeasures everything in the same way and then sends those measurements and a copy of the log of how it got those measurements to the attestation server. The attestation server then checks them over if they match. If the golden measurements and the new measurements match, the, that computer is allowed to join the net network, the corporate network, the enterprise network, the government network, whatever, in the normal manner, probably using a network access control device. 
But if they don't match, then that new system booting is moved over to a remediation network with a remediation server attached. And those, the logs and the, and the new measurements are checked. And the remediation server does whatever is necessary to bring that machine back into compliance. Re-updating firmware, putting it back to where it was supposed to be, changing the configuration of the machine. I think Microsoft is going to be talking about configuration interfaces that would allow flexibility to do this kind of thing. Um, so uh, basically, this remediation server puts it back the way it's supposed to be and then forces a reboot. And then it reboots, and if those new measurements from that boot match the golden measurements stored on the attestation server. The, the system is allowed to come up and rejoin the corporate network. So the idea is you don't put, a, you don't, in secure boot, we've got something fundamentally corrupted seriously and we don't want this machine to boot at all. But in the case of the, uh, a, a minor configurational change like, gee, enabling USB ports when our corporate standard is to have all USB ports must be disabled at all times. If the ports are not disabled, then don't allow the system to join the corporate network until they've been disabled and the system rebooted. Those kinds of things. This allows that kind of measured capability. Well, the government, the Commerce Department, National Institute of Standards and Technology, put out some guidelines about how this should be done in 2011. Turned out that it was a draft, and it wasn't implementable as is. There were some errors, there were some um, obvious gaps, that kind of thing. So a bunch of comments were submitted, both by the public and by the, tr um, by the Trusted Computing Organization, TCG. Um, Government did nothing with those. <laughs> they funding problems, whatever, pol politics, I'm not sure, but they've been sitting on it since 2012 or 13, and nothing has happened. TCG, which is, are the specialists in measured boot, were a little annoyed <laughs> at this, that, they, uh, that the guidelines requiring use of their technology were going nowhere. So they approached NIST recently and said, we'd like to help you finish up these guidelines and make them official and get the comments in so they're actually usable and workable. Um, and surprise, surprise, the government said, well, okay, sounds good to us. And the um, TCG PC client working group is going to be working on these guidelines. The exact format of how this happens um, is not clear. Whether they actually feed it back and provide a new 800-155 for the government to publish, or whether the government just points at a TCG document, or whatever, is unclear. But the information for you, this matters. The firmware vendors out there, the device manufacturer, everybody else is probably going to care about The OEMs are going to care about this. TCG, the, which many of you have organizational members with, if you don't, you should consider it, uh, will be working on this over the next several months. So this is a call to action. If you're interested at all in this space, you need to engage. Um, let's see. So, and one thing for Mark and the board here is TCG has already mentioned the possibility that they would like to form a cooperative agreement with UEFI so that we can share a work product before specs are published um, and coordinate our efforts between the two organizations. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's in progress. So uh, it was really shocking to me, but this is news from yesterday that the, the board of TCG approved this and that they're actually going to do this for the government. So um, it's really hot topic. Um, then also 193 has been mentioned here. Um, we've all been focused on uh, the 800-147 for years. 193 is really that on steroids. It's tri basically covers all the stuff that 147 did, plus it talks about option ROMs and other firmware and things like that, and all of it needs to be robust in the same way and secure and resilient and all. And this defines roots of trust again better and that kind of thing. My point for the people in this room is you need to be paying attention to this because uh, while it feels like, oh, this is just another 147, 
uh, it's really not. And it covers much more territory. And it's really easy to just scan through it and say, oh, yeah, we do that, we do that, we do that. And we don't have anything to worry about on this one. You need to check and make sure, really, are you covering all your bases? <laughs> do you really cover all the things that are required by this guideline? So anyway, um, this might be another one where the TCG and UEFI might collaborate. We'll see. And lastly, my last slide. Um, just a heads up from the TCG group that they specifically, um, Amy Nelson from Dell asked me specifically to bring this up today because it does affect firmware vendors and people who deal with the TCG code in the Tiano core base that, uh, that to now TPM, um, TPMs could be programmed either via polling or interrupts. Uh, the initial versions of the TPM chip were pole type devices. So there's a lot of latent code out there that polls the T uh, TPM, which results in boots being relatively slow. TCG has decided that this is no longer acceptable for performance reasons and that kind of thing. So the next version of the TCG specs in this place will require interrupts to be enabled and handled um, in firmware. So if you've got any old uh, the code that just works so it ain't broke so don't fix it kind of thing, you gotta fix it now. They just wanted to give, you, to give everybody here a heads up that that's coming. So I think the, basic, the, the interrupt code is in the Tiano core base, so it shouldn't be a big deal. But again, just a heads up to everybody. So any questions? I, I was just asking, um, if you don't have threading, how, how can having an interrupt versus polling on the TCG um, improve performance? <laughs> Clearly, we can have the discussion about that. But uh, the, uh, the idea, if you're not off doing something else, if you're blocked waiting, just spinning on the TPM, it, it'll actually be better performance to poll it. But um, nobody does that, realistically. Um, just, uh, you you got to have parallelism or things are you're not going to boot very fast at all. So. I, I believe that everybody, it, it, most everybody is uh, uh, doing other work in parallel and just going back and checking the TPM periodically to see if it finished. So another one here. Yeah, to clarify, because I've, I've worked on this a little bit, um, is, are you referring to interrupts at boot time in the firmware environment, or are you referring to interrupts enabled in the OS world? Uh, it's firmware is where this was discussed. Um, right, there are uh, ASL, or sorry, ACPI changes, AS, yeah, ASL changes that have to be implemented in the firmware, but my understanding is that it's enabled by the OS. Oh yeah, uh, I believe the OS is the OS. <laughs> there, there are many OSs out there and I don't want to be uh, focused on any of that, but yes, I believe uh, the current versions of Windows do enable interrupts, yes. But it's, it's in the firmware space where this is maybe not enabled properly. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Questions, anybody? Oh, one more. And I, while he's carrying the mic, I will, uh, I will be at the office hours thing this afternoon if somebody has questions. So that he didn't want to talk in the group. Go ahead. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe actually that's a question to <laughs> Brian. It was uh, several uh, features that are available or will be available in UDK 2018. So my understanding is all the new features originally committed to a master branch and then maybe later on they are cherry picked to the UDF. So isn't it correct that all the features initially go to the master branch? Yeah, so this is a I'll take this one and I'll yeah, even good. move up to the front so we can properly do this. So this is a implement, you can hang on to your mic, I've got this one. This is an implementation versus uh, specification question. Um, so Tiano Core has the EDK2 implementation, which is sort of the open source master branch that everything gets checked into uh, for that BSD license implementation. We periodically take stable snapshots, um, which are referred to as UDK with a year behind it, and that year is typically the year that it's released and it relates to some specifications uh, the year that they came out. So EDK 2018, which is coming very soon, uh, is a snapshot of many things that Felix, you're correct, are already committed to the master branch. The, the difference is that <clears throat> the features are probably already in the master branch now, 
but we do this annoying thing called validation, where we check to make sure they work on running systems. So the validation part is kind of what you get from UDK 2018, and then if once we continue to work on the master branch, if you want to stick with something that has a little bit, you think has a little bit more stability to it, then you've always got the, the Git hash for what we consider to be that UDK 2018 release. So you're right that many of the things he talked about, especially things like IOMMU, are already present in the code. It's just once we, we put the little sign on it that says UDK, we've done something to assure you that that might actually function on running hardware. Yeah, and there's always a situation where you've got the, uh, the you, nobody wants to work uh, on the tip of the of the main line uh, of the code. You no, all everybody wants to work it. on it. Nobody wants to ship it. Yeah, no one <laughs> wants to ship it on a product. <laughs> Small difference. So, okay, we've got we've quick? got a few minutes left. Uh, any more questions for Dick? Hopefully not for me. Hopefully for the guy who's been doing the excellent presentation. Okay, well, I will be around at three. So, uh. all right. Thanks again, Dick.